Hi everybody, welcome to module three, Categorization, Prejudice, and Discrimination. For this module, I made a Word document um, that I thought would be really useful to have large on your screen, and then maybe you could make the video of me be really, really small. That's my hope, and um, you could follow along. Um, hopefully you got through the chapter okay, chapter 8, send me any questions that you might have. The first thing I want to talk about today is differentiating a little bit between stereotypes and attitudes. So attitudes have a valence. Uh, they are how much you like slash don't like something, someone, or some group. How positively versus negatively you feel about them. How much you turn up your nose or are inclined to want to move towards someone. Stereotypes in and of themselves have no valence. They are just traits, characteristics that we assign to a group. Uh, sometimes we as scholars even break this rule. So we might talk about a negative stereotype, um, like being violent or incompetent, for instance, because this, this um, term is consistently used and negative all of the time. So we all say it's a negative stereotype. But, but, we try to stay true to this idea that many stereotypes, um, while we might think of them as negative, um, and stereotyping can be quite negative, as we'll talk about later in this unit, um, stereotypes in and of themselves are just traits. So um, this is one reason why, as your authors point out, communication is so important to understanding stereotypes. For instance, when some group is thought to be good with their money, that's the stereotype of that group, the way that we might talk about a group if we have a good attitude about that group is that they are very frugal. If we have a bad attitude about that group, we might say that they're cheap. Um, same characteristics, different spin that corresponds with the attitudes that we have for that group. Also, as your text describes on page 97 and also um, elsewhere, the use of different terms has something to do with the competitiveness and perceived comparative social status of the group. If an outgroup is financially successful, thus presenting a threat as having a one-up over one's own in-group, then calling that group cheap might serve the speaker's self-esteem because it demonstrates behaviors of that outgroup that might explain why they have social status. It demonizes them a little bit, and that makes the in-group, that makes the speaker feel better about his or her in-group. Um, in the book's uh, speeding example, think about the young person is reckless, the older person exceeds the speed limit. We see this as well in that example. Okay, so the next thing that I want to talk to you about is what it means that stereotypes have a kernel of truth. Um, you might even hear this sometimes, or you, or you might catch yourself saying it, you might find yourself saying it, that, um, well, stereotypes are there for a reason. Well, they're there for a reason. Um, other people finish that line with that they're true. Mm, no. Uh, let's talk about this in a couple of ways. Okay, so stereotypes have a kernel of truth. They have a truth to the people who perceive them. So this is a perception that people have. People hold, many people hold perceptions of group members. And so those perceptions, those traits that they imagine that group having, they carry truth in the thinker's own mind. So there's a truth to them, and that's important for us to try and recognize and understand. So it's true to them. And so as scholars, this is um, a, a way that we come to understand, well, they either had direct experiences, um, things that happened a certain way, that they perceived a certain way, or that someone helped them to understand a certain way that make them think that this trait is true of this group. Um, maybe an interactions they had with other people led them to believe the stereotype is true. Um, also, things that they were told, that the thinker of the stereotype was told by parents, close friends, other in-group members. It could also be what they read, what they saw on TV. Um, so one of the reasons it's so important to comp scholars that we recognize the truth to the stereotype holder um, is that they're upheld as true and people can behave as if they are very true and, and very important and um, very useful in understanding how other people behave. Okay, so that's part of this whole kernel of truth thing. Another thing that I want you to know is 
underneath some of that stereotypes have truth. People say, well, perhaps they heard of an empirical trend in which groups did differ on a certain behavior or um, a way of thinking. So some stereotypes do reflect empirical trends. Others are completely, completely, completely inaccurate. And so I'll give you some concrete examples here. For instance, there is an empirical trend that mothers are more affectionate than fathers. We see this in the literature. There is a statistically significant difference between these groups as a whole, meaning that as a whole, the whole group of moms are higher than dads in expressing affection with their children. But, but this doesn't mean that every single mom expresses a lot of affection and every single dad expresses a little affection. Some moms express very little affection. Some dads express a lot of affection. And this trend still holds up as empirically accurate that yes, as a group, mothers still express more affection than fathers. This is changing, by the way, in the literature, but we still see the trend, you know, um, even as dads become more affectionate. So the trend is true. The trend is empirically true. Um, now, other um, stereotypes are, are, are completely, completely inaccurate. Um, so it, since we're talking about affection, there is a stereotype that um, women are more romantic than men. Well, if we think about romance as believing that love is meant to last forever, that love no, lo, knows no boundaries, and that it is unwavering over a lifetime, men believe that more than women. Um, that's the empirical trend. Again, that doesn't mean that all men believe or are complete romantics and all women are unromantic, completely unromantic. But as a group, um, we do see that there is a, a difference there. Um, so that stereotype that women are more romantic, is com it doesn't even fit the empirical trend. Okay, even if we're looking at empirical trends, stereotyping is still problematic even if the stereotype coincides with an empirical trend, and here is why. Stereotyping leads us to think that everyone in a given group behaves a certain way, and we all have taken at least one statistic class or, you know, really thought about the groups that we're in and we step back and think about, it's like, yeah, not everyone in a group behaves the same way. It's a bit ridiculous, really, to think that all women express the same amount of affection, all men express the same amount of affection in their families or elsewhere, all women. Are, I mean, it, it's really kind of silly, but when we stereotype and we assume a trait belongs to a whole group, yeah, that's inaccurate. That, that is an inaccurate way to think. Um, but we still do it. It's pretty common. Okay, so that one's done. We're done with that. So I wanted to, um, I, I want to be sure that you got this next point, that although stereotyping is a cognitive function, your authors write that stereotypes cannot be extracted from their social context, nor can they be extracted from communication. Um, this is kind of like um, if you... Uh, fall out of the loop for a while with the news and then you turn on Saturday Night Live and you can tell they're like playing off of stereotypes but you don't really get it. Well, it's because you're missing that context, right? Um, the book gives many specifics about abstract versus general language and the hypotheses explaining their use. You don't need to know the specific theory, the hypotheses surrounding these findings, not right now, but it does all set the stage for theories to come and it is a nice reminder that communication is the way that stereotypes truly affect and reflect identities of ourselves and of others. And that's why even though stereotypes are all about what we think other p other groups say, do, how they act, what they believe, all of these things, um, those are just thoughts that we have when we have a stereotype. There are great consequences for communication. And also stereotypes can be formed and developed and nurtured from our communication with other people. So they're totally linked. Okay, the next thing I wanna to talk to you about um, is prototypes versus exemplars. So both a prototype and an exemplar, these are both things that exist in people's mind as a kind of average for a group, but a physical manifestation of that, of that average, uh, like an aggregate group member. So um, let's take prototype first. 
A prototype is this average member that we have created in our minds. So, for instance, I have a prototype of a professor in my mind um, that is um, an older man. He's very distinguished looking, which when I say distinguished, I mean he has some a lot of gray hair. Um, he wears a tweed jacket with the um, elbow patches in it. He wears wire-rimmed glasses that sometimes he puts down lower in his nose. He drinks scotch. Brilliant. Says um, witty things and um, is, is very poised and um, walks with really great posture. So that's a prototype. I, I don't have any professors who look like this person that I imagine. And you notice I said he too. It's a man. Um, I, I've had some male professors, I've had some professors with gray hair, um, many brilliant professors, but you know what? I have no one that fits that. That's not a real person. The closest thing is the professor from McGilligan's Island, which I'm sure was built on people's prototypes of what a professor is, right? An exemplar is very similar, except that this is an actual human being. So an exemplar is somebody that we know that to us really represents that group. And so you may even have a professor who fits that group, um, uh, who, who to you, when you think professor, you think of um, Professor Smith or um, Professor Elaine Miles, you know, whomever that person is. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is ethnophallisms and code words. I apologize. I recognize that there are some nasty things in this chapter, and I thought about telling you about it ahead of a time ahead of time, but I was also afraid that might prime you. The reality of it is when we study prejudice, we study some things that can get pretty nasty and, and harsh. Um, so you learn the definitions and the de and the differences between these. You also learn that some social groups have been really successful in making it unacceptable or less acceptable for us to use these stereotype markers. So for example, um, the women's rights movement, African Americans and the civil rights movement, um, those who are differently abled now have a, um, a, a different and um, there's a different level of acceptance. I would argue little to no acceptance for ridiculing people publicly for, for many of these things. It used to be commonplace to, to discriminate openly against these groups. Um, but I, I want you to think for yourselves, especially as we move um, closer to the application assignments that we'll be talking about um, in a couple modules here, that um, some of the groups that people in your work can still talk about in these ways uh, what kind of code words are used? I, I don't have any empirical data on this, but an example from my own um, work world that seems it might be fitting is that um, people describe women as having this thing of a resting bitch face, which I've inquired a couple times, so I think I get it. It's where they're not smiling when they're just hanging out and not talking about something happy. They just have a straight face like this, and that's called a resting bitch face. Um, I've never heard it used about men, but I think a lot of human beings aren't always smiling, especially when they're just sitting there. So to me, this seems it could be a way to dig at women without coming across as sexist. So think for your own work about how those might manifest, um, draw it back to that realm. Okay, the next thing I want to talk to you about is a stepping back. Um, this categorization is the road to bias. So... Um, Having read and listened to so many negative things that come out of reacting to each other as group members rather than as individuals, there's probably a part of you that thinks, is it always this bad, Christy? I mean, does it have to be? And really, do we really think, oh, out group member, bad, and maybe even treat them badly because of that? Um, well, my answer is, well, it can be. It can be pretty bad. Um, but I want to, it doesn't always have to be. So what I want to do next is I'm going to talk about these three stages of the categorization process that take us from our thoughts to um, mistreatment of other people. Um, and, and it might give you a little bit more clarity about how this process works. Um, it's not going to give you too much hope yet, but in the weeks ahead, we get a little bit more hopeful. So here we go. So first, um, this um, road to bias and categorization as road to bias, this is from Penelope Oaks. 
she has a great piece that I can send your way if you want to read more details about it. I'm going to give you the synopsis today. So the first stage is the activation stage, and I'm going to read you a quotation of hers that really captures this. So she says, we become victims of spontaneous, unintentional stereotype use, applying beliefs which are not our own, but foisted upon us by cultural currency. In case it's not easy for you to stop and rewind um, the video, let me just tell you that again. We become victims of spontaneous, unintentional stereotype use, applying beliefs which are not our own, but foisted upon us by cultural currency. So we activate, we bam, we, we draw on these stereotypes that we have been inundated with. It's almost like you can't escape them. That's why she says we're victims to it. And, and, and even if we think, gosh, that, that, that really can't be true, that people in that group just behave that way because in that group, we've heard it so many times that it's quick for us to recall that information. So um, when we see someone who fits a certain category, for instance, um, we see wrinkles. We see wrinkles and we're, and we're visual creatures. Um, if we have the capability in the interaction to see the other person, we draw from what they look like and how they behave to make assumptions. So I see wrinkles, I see gray, ha gray hair, you're old. That's your group. Um, and when I see you as old, I instantly activate my stereotypes for old. Stereotypes like frail and slow. We have the stereotype, um, and we've heard that so much in every commercial, jokes, things our grandparents told us all over the place, that the two, old and frail and old and slow, they just go together real quick, activate it, activate it, super fast. Um, we have a similar uh, a stereotype uh, across the culture, across American culture, that dark skin means um, more aggressive. And if someone has dark skin, they're more aggressive than if someone has a lighter skin tone, that, um, that, they are, that they are calmer, that they are less aggressive. So again, you just have to think about it. You're like, what? Um, but again, there are so many messages out there that feed into those stereotypes that as a member of our culture, you activate these when you see individuals with these traits, okay, that cue these stereotypes. So number one is activation. Okay, that's the first step. Number two, um, construal. So the construal stage, this is where we lump all people of a group together. Okay, we think old, frail. Now, at, the, at step one, at step two, all old people are old and frail. Um, a simple fact is that this Cognitive process of grouping, the process of categorization, it's done to simplify. That's why we categorize, so that we can simplify our world. And so what we do when we categorize is we put people, put them in the category, put them in the category. And whenever you categorize, you will accentuate similarities among those within a group and accentuate dissimilarity between the groups. This is what we've been talking about, right? So um, the um, this is why, for instance, the stereotype that black males in particular are aggressive led to a classic experiment. Duncan, in 1976, um, did this um, experiment. We see that the same ambiguous touch of just touching another person's arm, touching another person's arm, reaching out and touching that arm, very ambiguous gesture. Um, it is perceived as aggressive when a black man does it, and it's perceived as friendly or non-aggressive when a white man does it. Now, there were some differences depending on um, the person who was witnessing it, their you know, group they belonged to, things like that. But still, still, we saw that this trend persisted in which the same exact behavior is interpreted differently. Why? Because of the construal. Because we think black aggressive. So when someone who is black does that gesture, we're thinking he's in that group, he's aggressive, and we interpret his behavior in one way. The same exact behavior, but someone who's in a different group does it. They're in the con a different con a different construal, a different group. We think differently. We think differently about their behaviors. Okay. So one activation, two construal, three discrimination. 
discrimination is where the stereotypes ultimately lead to differential treatment. This is where the communication occurs. So um, this is um, where in that previous scenario, if you, if you see um, the black man versus the white man having that same just simple gesture, and you thought aggressive for the black man, well, maybe the discrimination is that you um, avoid one man and you move toward the other. Maybe it's that simple. Um, uh, maybe um, you avoid eye contact with one. Um, maybe you actually say something, say something different to the black man or the white man, or say something different about those men. Um, you know, we do see that um, the, the, the correlation, there is a correlation between stereotype, stereotype activation, and, um, you know, how quickly we draw on our stereotypes, and also when asked how much we believe stereotypes to be true, and how we treat other people. There is a link. There is a link that is there. Um, it isn't all of the time, though, that we see this. Now, part of it is it is difficult to um, always, you know, um, this experiment is a good one. There are other experiments that are good at showing very cleanly, um, you know, very, very clean and neat scientific demonstration of how stereotype out of activation leads to discrimination. Um, but, but it is tricky. Um, in real life, everyday life, it can be hard to measure these things. Let me give you another example of a really um, a great study. It's a recurring study. You, these usually make it on the national news. Um, studies about resumes. Resume studies are relatively easy to conduct. You have the same resume material, so all of the same qualifications um, are put on a bunch of resumes, the same exact resume, and then you just switch out the names at the top. You um, make the names... Um, sound like they're from different groups and you know see where I'm going with this here we see that people whose names sound to come from a certain group tend to get hired or called for interviews more than those that sound like they're from a different group and given that the credentials are are, are all exactly the same this um, demonstrates that we treat people different based on um, the groups to which we think they belong so at any rate, though, those show it, right? But but it can be difficult to show. Um, so that's like kind of a sad thing, right? Of course, um, we know that these things are linked. Our stereotype activation and our differential treatment are linked. They're particularly linked when we don't have a lot of time and we're just acting on impulse to behave a certain way. Um, but but here's the here's the pro-social side. And as an intergroup scholar, as someone who studies discrimination and prejudice, I'm still incredibly hopeful. People are amazing. And um, one of the reasons why people who activate stereotypes don't always discriminate is that they are mindful. They are mindful that they categorize, for instance. They are mindful that categorizing people and stereotyping can be incredibly problematic. So they really think about that. Um, they think about it and um, they make strides toward communicating with people as individuals. Um, another thing that I want to point out about categorization is that Penelope Oaks and other scholars point out that it is a quite natural thing we categorize things in our world so that we can make sense of them. And that's why we like categorizing, so that we can know how to behave in certain situations. And as I pointed out before, there can be times where these norms are helpful in helping us know, for instance, how to behave toward a woman who just gave birth, recognizing, oh, okay, she's in this group, might be some things that she would need or not need me to say or do. It's helpful, you know? Um, but just because things are natural, remember the naturalistic fallacy is a fallacy. To say that because something comes naturally to us or that it's a natural mechanism doesn't always mean that it is useful for humans to continue. It doesn't mean that we should just give in to it because it's natural. Um, there are a lot of behaviors um, that, that are natural that we certainly wouldn't condone. Things that happens in, happen in the animal kingdom, we wouldn't condone. 
Um, so it's important to keep it in mind that, yeah, let's not feel too bad about ourselves for stereotype activation. Um, at the same time, um, let's recognize that there is a link there. Okay, with that being said, um, the activity that you're going to do this week is an IAT activity. Um, that is the implicit association test. When you conduct, I'm so sorry, when you um, take an implicit association test for this activity, um, please pull up the instructions. The website changes often, and I believe I have something accurate about the the quickest way for you to navigate that and take tests that will um, not take you an incredibly long amount of time. Um, I, I want to tell you this, the, the website gives some information as well, but you are essentially taking a test on this very first stage, the stereotype activation stage. Not discrimination, okay? Um, but you're taking a test about stereotype activation. Um, and make sure that you have no distractions take your time, try and um, get those distractions out, or the test won't work, actually, if, if you don't, if, you, um, if you're distracted in any way. Um, another thing, um, I want you to keep in mind this analogy. Like Penelope Oaks, um, I'm a firm believer that stereotypes are, are, are all around us to the point that many of them we are victims to. So um, when this test asks you to agree with stereotypes, activate stereotypes that are the flip, that are the reverse of what you've been trained to think about, you may be slower to respond or you may even respond incorrectly. This to me is quite similar to if you were driving into work tomorrow and um, before you left I said, okay, th things have changed this morning. Today, green light means stop. Red light means go. You got it? You got it? All right, go. You're smart. Go ahead. Well, you're smart. You'd be able to do it. But gosh, it'd be a rough ride to work, wouldn't it? You may have an accident. Or every time you came toward that, that light, you would be like, oh, red means go, go. Am I sure? Am I sure? Well, that can be a little bit like the IAT. So maybe keep that in mind if um, you're feeling a little bit down about any results that you might get. Um, good luck. I look forward to reading your responses and um, thanks so much for, for watching this video.